All right, so in Ezekiel 29, through chapters 32, uh, we are covering just judgment against Egypt. And so last week, we had multiple chapters concerning the destruction of Tyre. Now tonight, we've got multiple chapters concerning the destruction of Egypt. And we'll finish off what we didn't get this morning in chapter 33. It's not a whole lot, but it's a little bit more. My goal was that would push us far enough forward into Ezekiel that we could cover up to chapter 37 next week. And there's a lot of meat in 34, 5, 6, and 7 of Ezekiel. And that would give us then maybe one whole week to tackle Ezekiel 38 and 9. Um, so we've got some stuff coming up. But one thing I'll say with this is that tonight as we go through Egypt, I have way less slides than normal. I think it'll move along pretty quick because a lot of it's very straightforward. There's some fun nuggets throughout every chapter. But what we need to remember, these were contemporary prophecies against one of the world nations greater than any nation the world had ever known. At the time of the writing of Ezekiel, Egypt had always been around. They were one of the first great nations, first great empires conquering the world. They had their ups, they had their downs, but they were there. And I mean, it was a huge power. And we're going to get to the verses tonight where it says, Egypt, you'll never be a world power ever again. Oh, it, you will be a nation. They might have an army but it's not going to be the great Egyptian empire that conquered all of the Middle East over and over again throughout its time. We'll even have a little a timeline we'll look at. So as we look at this stuff, what we need to think, now we're in America, so we can't do America because it's not against their own nation. But imagine you're the Jews in Babylon. You know, it's like us. If someone started to prophesy and then they did it again in two weeks and they did it again in four months and then they did it again next year and these prophecies kept coming out and they're saying, England is going to fall. The United Kingdom will be broken. The United Kingdom will no longer be a first world nation. The United Kingdom will no longer have this. They'll no longer have that. You think about like, well, okay, Britain, right? England, they've always been around, you know? And, and kind of in our day and age, like these guys have been around, right? They're, it'd be amazing to think that England would just be done. And that's what these prophecies are. So with us, it's, it's kind of a different feel as we're here in the 21st century reading back on these. But for them, as they began to see the prophecies come to reality, it was mind-blowing. And so it's something like that where it might seem repetitive to us, but to them it's like, man, he said it again and again and again, and I just didn't believe. But then they started coming true one after the other, and it would have been an eye-opener for the Jewish people as Ezekiel's prophesying to them. So... I didn't make this on slides, but if you're a note taker, I did write all the dates because there's a lot of dates in here telling us when they were done. And so I just kind of jotted down dates in each section as we move along. And so starting in chapter 29, this would be January of the year 587 BC. This would have been around the time when Nebuchadnezzar was going to Jerusalem to besiege it, but Jerusalem hasn't fallen yet. So we're seeing a little bit of time lapse in here. Um, and there's going to be a little bit of jumping around. A little bit later in this chapter, they're going to insert stuff. We'll get there in a second. But in the 10th year, in the 10th month, on the 12th day of the month, the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, set your face against Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and prophesy against them, against all of Egypt, and speak to him saying, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against you, O Pharaoh, king of Egypt, O great monster who lies in the midst of the rivers, who has said, My river is my own. I have made it for myself but I'll put hooks in your jaws, cause the fish of your rivers to stick to your scales. I'll bring you up out of the midst of your rivers and all the fish in your rivers will stick to your scales. I'll leave you in the wilderness, you and all the fish of your rivers. You shall fall in the open field. You shall not be picked up or gathered. I have given you as food to the beasts of the field and to the birds of the air. He's picturing Pharaoh as a great sea monster of the Nile River. In this context, you might think a crocodile because the Nile River was known for its crocodiles. And they have found crocodiles in the Nile River that are 30, 40 feet long. So this room's about 40 feet. No, wait, it's 30 feet. This is 40 feet. So that's 30 feet. Imagine a crocodile as long as this up to as long as this. That's the kind of crocodile skeletons we find. Speaking of old big lizard skeletons, Here's the fascinating thing in verse 3. I said there's some little nuggets in here, stuff that nerds like me love to read about. 
O great monster who lies in the midst of the rivers. I don't know if you have a different translation than that in verse 3. Mine says, Pharaoh, king of Egypt, O great monster. But the word there in the Hebrew is tanin. And this is an interesting word because some Bibles translate it whale in some places. Some translate it jackal in some places. In Genesis 1, when God creates the sea creatures, right? The sea creatures and the air creatures on day five, the first thing mentioned, I think the old King James says whale. And many today will say sea monster or sea creatures. It's that same word. If you want to take things one step further in the weird category, when Moses is commanded to throw down a rod in front of Pharaoh, and it's going to turn into a serpent, most of our Bibles say. It's that word. It's actually not the word nehesh for a serpent. It's actually the word tanin. Many of the older translations will translate this often as dragon. What we find with the Hebrew language is their words had a lot of flexibility. The same word that used for rod, like a scepter, it's actually the same word for scepter, is the spare of the rod with, a ch- with discipline. That's the same word. A staff can be the same word. A branch of a tree can be the same word. So it's like, it really is context. They have words that can have lots of meaning. And it seems like this word tanim speaks of a giant reptile, but sometimes it is explicitly spoken of being in the sea, but sometimes it's not in the sea. Sometimes it's very definitely on land. But it seems as back then, there were giant reptiles. Go figure. And we can talk about dinosaurs in the Bible another day, but when you start reading the descriptions of these things, when you read of behemoth and Leviathan in the book of Job, it's describing dinosaurs. There's just no way it can be anything else. The behemoth, this gigantic land creature that can eat branches of the tree, it can stand in a river and not be moved, and it's got a tail like a cedar tree. Some Bibles say, well, this could be a rhino or an elephant. No, they've never seen the tail of a rhino or of an elephant then is the problem. It says, tail like a cedar tree. That kind of narrows it down real quick. In Psalm 73, I believe it is, um, or sorry, Psalm 74, verses 13 and 14, it makes reference to Tanin in verse 13, and then Leviathan in verse 14, tying them in together. And so the Bible speaks of giant lizards, giant reptiles. And it's kind of like they had a word for giant reptile. Now, I watched a documentary on dragons called How to Train Your Dragon. And from it, I learned that dragons come in all shapes and sizes. And that's, I think, with the Hebrew word, that would be more realistic. They had a word for very big reptile. And if you've seen dragon movies, it doesn't matter if it's this kind, that kind, this, they were all dragons. And for them, tanin was this, it was a giant reptile. So if there was a, let's just say it was a normal crocodile, but it's 40 feet long, as long as this room this way. That's a giant reptile. Now, if you see a brachiosaurus, that's a giant reptile too, right? And so it's just fascinating as you go through and see how this word is used throughout the Bible. New King James often puts it as jackal. It's my last little thing, but you'll notice it, it talks about the jackal. Some Bibles say owl. A better translation, I think New King James gets it on this one, is ostrich. And that word for ostrich, which some translators, they struggled on what these ancient words were, it was basically like the biggest bird. Now, there are big birds for flying, but obviously, if you don't count, if it's not just flying birds, the ostrich is the biggest bird by far. Those things are stinking huge. I am in, do you know ostriches can get to nine feet tall? Nine feet tall. That is a big bird. And so some of these verses where they say the jackal and the ostrich, well, jackal's tanin. I don't think it's a jackal. I think it's a really big reptile. And I think they're just using these illustrations of the biggest reptile and the biggest bird. So it's things like that where you get the glean stuff. So he's probably talking about a crocodile, but maybe it's some other giant reptile that lived in the Nile River. And he's telling the Pharaoh, you know, I'm going to pick you out of there. You think you're a giant reptile, beast, crocodile, dinosaur, whatever. I'm just going to get you out of there. And all your little fish, that's all the little cities, all the other nations that kind of have been taken over and support Egypt. They're all coming out with you and I'm casting you aside. Verse six now, it says, then all the inhabitants of Egypt shall know that I am the Lord because they have been a staff of reed to the house of Israel. When they took hold of you with the hand, you broke and tore all their shoulders. When they lean on you, you broke and made all their backs quiver. Now, what it's talking about is that you're a staff. Now, what do you use a staff for? It's a walking stick, right? You use it to lean on. Someone who needs help might walk with a cane. Well, what happens if this person who's depending on a cane 
the cane flexes and snaps and breaks because the Nile River had all these reeds, you know, these water plants, long and thin to see people in the cartoons breathing through the reeds as, you know, Bugs Bunny or something's run away from the bad guys and they're swimming with it. But reeds, they're not that strong. You, you bend them, they flex, and once they snap, they're done for. In 2 Kings 18, 21, it says, now look, you are trusting in the staff of this broken reed, Egypt. So this is a picture they use multiple times on which if a man leans, it will go into his hand and pierce it. So is Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to all who trust him. So they're just saying there's this picture of if you're leaning on Egypt. And at this point, when Babylon came down to conquer um, after 597, and they took away Jehoiachin, and they put Zedekiah on the throne, Zedekiah eventually made a pact with Egypt. So when Babylon was besieging them, we read about it in Jeremiah that Egypt came up. And actually, Babylon broke the siege for a little while to came chase Egypt. Egypt fled, and they went right back and destroyed Jerusalem. And so God's angry that his people are trusting in Egypt instead of him. He's angry that his people are leaning on Egypt, this reed that's just going to bend and break instead of leaning on him. Verse 8, therefore, thus says the Lord God, surely I'll bring a sword upon you, cut you off from man and beast. The land of Egypt shall become desolate and waste. Then they'll know that I'm the Lord because he said the river is mine and I've made it. Indeed, therefore, I am against you and against your rivers, and I will make the land of Egypt utterly waste and desolate from Migdal to Serene as far as the border of Ethiopia. Verse worth its knowing, Migdal is a Hebrew word for, for tower, but it represented a tower on the north side of Egypt. Sain is, is Aswan, where the Aswan Dam is. It's on the south side of Egypt. So just like we often read in the Old Testament, Israel from Deir to Beersheba, that was a northernmost city to a southernmost city of the populated area. That's the same thing he's saying here, from north to south. Verse 11, neither foot of man shall pass through it, nor foot of beast through it, and it shall be uh, uninhabited for 40 years. I'll make the land of Egypt desolate in the midst of countries that are desolate, and among the cities that are laid waste, her cities shall be desolate for 40 years. I'll scatter the Egyptians among the nations, disperse them throughout the countries. Yet thus says the Lord God, at the end of 40 years, I'll gather the Egyptians from the peoples among whom they were scattered, I'll bring back the captives of Egypt, cause them to return to the land of Pathros, to the land of the or their origin, and there they shall be a lowly kingdom. It shall be the lowliest of kingdoms. It shall never exalt itself above the nations, or never again exalt itself above the nations. For I'll diminish them so that they will not rule over the nations anymore. No longer shall it be the confidence of the house of Israel, but will remind them of their iniquity when they turn to follow them. Then they shall know that I am the Lord God." So a couple of things. This is one of the examples where we have no archaeological evidence that describes a 40-year period of Egypt being conquered and scattered. Now, there's no evidence conflicting with that either. There's just nothing. One of the main reasons for that is when you get your butt kicked and you're telling your family story, you usually leave out those parts. And that's kind of what it is. Egypt had a great history record, but there are gaps in the Egyptian history record. And usually those were the times when they were being defeated. They don't write about that kind of stuff. Now, what's interesting is if we timeline this, it's about 40 years from the time of Nebuchadnezzar going down to Egypt and about the time that Cyrus of the Persians would come. And remember, it's when Persia defeated Babylon that Persia let the Jews return home. And so God says, I'll disperse Egypt for 40 years and then I'll let them return. It's very likely it's during this window of time where the Persians who were known for letting people go back that the Assyrians and Babylonians had dispersed, that they'll come back. So I have in my Bible written, you know, no evidence, dot, 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 yet. Because that's been the story of the Bible. The Hittites in the Bible, they weren't known, they weren't known about until the early 20th century. But people used to mock, well, there's no Hittites. We've never heard of Hittites. Now we found tons of, it was a huge empire. The Hittite empire actually made it all the way into Egypt at one point. So we've learned a lot since then. Well, there's no such thing as Pontius Pilate. There's no such thing as, we would know about Pontius Pilate if there was Pontius Pilate. The Romans had great records until one day when they made the Aswan Dam, we were just talking about Aswan, and Caesarea Maritime shows up on the seashore in Israel. And there they find the Pilate Stone, the big stone, part of the city that mentions Pilate's name. 
History is always just catching up to the Bible. And that's what we keep finding again and again and again. Sometimes there are gaps where there's no evidence, but it's what's called an argument from silence. We don't have anything saying the Bible's wrong. We just don't have secular history backing up the Bible on some minor points. Now it says in verse 15, there'll be the lowliness of kingdoms. It shall never again exalt itself above the nations. Now, behind me, we've got a timeline of all the kingdoms of Egypt going all the way up to the time of Christ and actually even past the time of Christ. Now, you've got the old kingdom way long ago. You've got the middle kingdom. Now, the new kingdom up there, which went from, you know, 1,600 to 1,000, that's rounding numbers, that's when the, the Egyptians were enslaving the Hebrews. That's when they would have been down in Egypt. But you'll notice there's a gap there with no color because there's no great kingdom. The Assyrians came in and messed with Egypt. My little thing I found on the internet mentions the Persians, doesn't even mention the Babylonians, but it would have been right there in the middle. And you'll notice the only kingdoms to show up after this are the Ptolemaic uh, kingdom and the Romans. The Ptolemy came after Alexander the Great. It's not really an Egyptian kingdom. Alexander, a Macedonian, conquered Egypt, and then when he died, his kingdom broke into four directions. And so like the Seleucids was one of his generals. Ptolemy was one of his generals, Ptolemy I. He got Egypt, but they were Greeks and Macedonians. They were putting Greek culture and Greek buildings everywhere. It wasn't really an Egyptian empire. And the Ptolemaic empire lasted until the last person in the empire, a girl by the name of Cleopatra, who many of us know the name, right? And at that point, the Romans take over. So even back then, there were some Egyptian powers, but they weren't Egyptian. They were foreign powers who had conquered Egypt. So we see, after this point in Bible history, Egypt was never a power again. All right, now for the note takers, this is the one, Ezekiel starts this prophecy against Egypt and he decides to finish it all in this chapter. Almost all of Ezekiel is chronological. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you. I did it for the blessings. Um, but 17 to 21 is actually 571 BC. It's 17 years later. And he, I think he inserts it here because it basically just shows that it's going to come to an end. And this ties into last week. It says, It came to pass in the 70, 27th year, in the first month, first day of the month, that the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, caused his army to labor strenuously. I like King James says, served a great service against Tyre. Every head was made bald and every shoulder rubbed raw. Yet neither he nor his army received wages from Tyre for the labor which they expend on it. So if you were here last week, if you followed along last week, he spent 13 years with Tyre under siege, but Nebuchadnezzar never got to conquer the island of Tyre. And so his men... These are soldiers away from home fighting battles for 13 years. So when it says that every shoulder was rubbed raw, that's like from carrying siege equipment and working like for 13 years trying to defeat these guys. And every head was made bald is because it's just really attractive look. And then we see tire. There we go. People are paying attention. Um, no, I mean, wearing your helmet for 13 years is the idea. Their heads are worn and all the hair is gone because they've been wearing battle armor on their heads. So what does God do? And I like, again, labored strenuously. In the Hebrew, the King James kind of picks it up, which served a great service. They double up words to kind of emphasize this idea. But labored strenuously, he was serving God because God called him to do that. So therefore, verse 19, thus says the Lord God, surely I will give the land of Egypt to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. He shall take away her wealth, carry off her spoil, remove her pillage, and that will be wages for his army. I have given him the land of Egypt for his labor because they worked for me, says the Lord God. In that day, I'll cause the horn of the house of Israel to spring forth. I'll open up your mouth to speak in their midst. Then they shall know that I am the Lord. And so he's saying, right? Nebuchadnezzar, a pagan at the time, at least. He may have come around later. But at the time, a pagan, foreign nation. But God says they work for me because everyone works for God. 
in the end of the day, he's got his hand on everything and people do what God wants them to do. And in verse 21, it just basically says, in that day, when it finally comes to the end, my people are gonna rejoice and they're gonna realize, wow, God is telling the truth. I can't believe England fell. No one would have thought it back at the beginning of the prophecy, but now this great nation that's always been around has fallen. It's just mind-blowing. Chapter 30, so again, it's going to be these continual prophecies against them. Chapter 30 actually doesn't have dates in the beginning, so people think it's actually probably in line with the same date in the beginning of 29. The word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, prophesy uh, and say, thus says the Lord God, wail, woe to the day, for the day is near. Even the day of the Lord is near. It'll be a day of clouds, the time of the Gentiles. The sword shall come upon Egypt. A great anguish shall be in Ethiopia. When the slain fall in Egypt and they take away her wealth and her foundations are broken down, Ethiopia, Libya, Lydia, all the mingled people, Chub and the men of the lands who are allied shall fall with them by the sword. So there's some interesting prophetic wording in here and, and scholars differ because they say it's like, man, we've got some buzzwords for eschatology, talking about the day of the Lord, the day of clouds, the time of the Gentiles. You know, these are words that ring with eschatology, but this seems more directly related to Egypt. So if there's a tie, it's really hard to piece it together. In verse five, it mentions different neighbor, uh, nations. Where it mentions Chub. We learned, I learned two things about Chub. One, scholars all agree they don't know where it is. They just, they just don't know. Scholars also agree it's a bad nickname for your wife. So that was the two things I gleaned off of the word chub. And that's the true of the Bible. You know, it's funny how we read the Bible and there are words, there are places no one knows. Why? Because they were 3,000 years ago and we don't have maps. <laughs> but we know all these other nations, so it's probably just one of those smaller places that was in there. Now, thus says the Lord, verse six, those who uphold Egypt shall fall and the pride of her power shall come down from Migdal to Syene. Those who are within her shall fall by the sword, says the Lord God. They shall be desolate in the midst of the desolate countries. Her cities shall be in the midst of the cities that are laid waste. Then they'll know that I am the Lord when I set a fire in Egypt and all her helpers are destroyed. On that day, messenger, my messengers or messengers shall go forth from me in ships to make the careless Ethiopians afraid and great anguish shall fall upon them as the day of Egypt, for indeed it is coming. And like I said, it just kind of keeps rolling. It's a continued prophecy. Thus says Lord God, verse 10, I'll also make a multitude of Egypt to cease by the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. He and his people with him, the most terrible of nations, shall be brought to destroy the land. They shall draw their swords against Egypt and fill the land with their slain. I'll make the rivers dry. I'll sell the land in the hand of the wicked. I'll make the land waste and all that is in it. By the hands of aliens, I, the Lord, have spoken. Thus says the Lord God, I'll also destroy all the idols to cause the images to cease I'll give you a few modern Egyptian names or more common names you're, you're familiar with and you can try and write them down furiously or you can go back and listen. But to cease from Noph, Noph is Memphis. So a lot of these have ancient names that we can tie into more modern names that we know. There shall no longer be princes in the land of Egypt. I will put fear in the land of Egypt. Verse 14, I will make Pathros desolate. That's Thebes in upper Egypt and set fire to Zone. That's Goshen, where the, where the Israelites were, down in the delta in the southern or northern lower Egypt. Uh, Goshen and, and Zoan, it's also known as Tanis, made popular by the raiders of the Lost Ark. So if you heard the name Tanis, that's the city that they're looking for in Indiana Jones. And I'll execute judgment in No, that's the name of a city, ancient Pelusium. Uh, and I'll, that, that one is, uh, there's so many different ones now. And on Sin, and that's the name of a city, the strength of Egypt. I'll cut off the multitudes from No. That's another name for Thebes. There we go. Set a fire in Egypt. Sin uh, shall have a great pain. No shall be split open. And Noph shall be in distress daily. The young men of Avon, Heliopolis, and Pi Beseth shall fall by the sword. These cities shall go into captivity. And Tathanes, the day of also shall be darkened when I break the yoke of Egypt there. And her arrogant strength shall cease in her. As for her, a cloud shall cover her and her daughters shall go into captivity. Thus I will execute judgment on Egypt. Then they shall know that I am the Lord. Whew. I'll tell you, it's prophecies like these. Like I said at the beginning, to us, it's kind of like, I'll say this to me, to me, you can have your own opinion. 
it just kind of goes and goes and goes and goes. But once again, one day when that judgment comes and the people of Egypt are experiencing the sword, people are being slain in the streets, God can say, I warned you and 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 warned you. And what makes for a long Bible study is also the grace of God. It's what it is. It's, I'm, I'm keep telling you, keep telling you, keep telling you, keep telling you. And so I sometimes have to take myself and place myself in the feet of these people back then, right? It's like, okay, I'm, I get it, God. You're going to destroy them. Okay, you're still, I'm going to destroy them. I'm going to destroy them. But it's like, but you know, if God was going to destroy you and your family, I'd be happy that he gave me warning after warning after warning after warning after warning after warning after warning, after warning driving it home. Now, starting in verse 20, we have a date. It would be April of 587. So it's a few months, four months after the beginning of chapter 29. It says, It came to pass the 11th month, the first month, on the seventh day of the month, that the word Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, I have broken the arm of Pharaoh of Egypt, and see, it has not been bandaged for healing, nor a splint put on the, to bind it, to make it strong enough to hold a sword. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, I am surely against Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and I'll break his arms, both the strong one and the one that was broken, and I'll make the sword fall out of his hand. So there was a, a symbol in Egypt that was commonly the arm of Pharaoh, like his might, his strength. And so God's using their own pictures and terminology. He's like, I'm breaking those arms. Verse 23, I'll scatter the Egyptians among the nations, disperse them among uh, through the, and the nations and disperse them throughout the countries. 24, I'll strengthen the arms of the king of Babylon, put my sword in his hand. I'll break Pharaoh's arms. He'll groan before him with the groanings of a mortally wounded man. Thus I'll strengthen the arms of the king of Babylon, but the arms of Pharaoh shall fall down. They shall know that I am the Lord when I put my sword in the hand of the king of Babylon, and he stretches it out against the land of Egypt. I will scatter the Egyptians among the nations, disperse them through the countries. Then they shall know that I am the Lord. And so it's kind of repeating a little bit of what we heard earlier. But again, remembering what we just read now was from 587. What we read kind of identical was from four months earlier. So again, it's he warned. Now here's four months later. He's saying the same thing again, but he's trying to get the point across. Now in chapter 31, it's June of 587. So we see a couple more months go by. And here's another prophecy. So Ezekiel just keeps him coming. Now it came to to pass in the 11th year, the third month on the first day of the month, that the word Lord came to me saying, Son of man, say to Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and to his multitude, whom are you like in your greatness? Indeed, Assyria was a cedar in Lebanon with fine branches that shaded the forest and of high stature, and its top was among the thick boughs. The waters made it grow. Underground waters gave it height with their rivers running around the place where it was planted, and it sent out rivulets to all the trees in the field." He uses the picture of a cedar tree, and he's talking about Assyria. And so what is going to happen in this chapter? He's going to say, Egypt, you remember Assyria. They came down and fought with you and defeated you, actually, in battle not long ago. They were a great and powerful nation, but they're gone now. They are all dead and gone. Nineveh has been defeated. The Assyrians have been wiped out by the Babylonians, the same people I'm sending to you. But he's trying to show them, but remember Assyria. They were this big and beautiful, powerful nation. And he likens them to the cedar of Lebanon. Cedrus Lebani. Now, it's a fascinating tree because if you could have a person stand down there, it looks kind of like a redwood. They're huge. What makes them impressive, I was just talking to John here at church about he went down and got to go through the redwoods like last week. And we were talking about how big the redwoods trees are. I mean, if you've never gone down, if you've never seen them in person, I, it's been so long since I've seen my wanna go. These trees are just massive. But the difference is, is that our redwoods, they're like a typical fir tree where they go whoosh, way high and their branches come out. Whereas the cedars of Lebanon, not only were huge around and they were fairly tall, they'd get to 130, 150 feet. They're big. But you see how their branches go way out. I mean, that's one thing where they're very different is they just stretch wide, almost as big as my tree, right, Mr. Anderson? Yeah, okay, so... Um, inside joke, but you know, got a big tree in my old house. Um, but the point is, they're these beautiful trees. So we read about the, the cedars of Lebanon throughout the Bible because they were world renowned. These things were huge and the, the big branches. And so, and they're beautiful. And so God's saying, 
Remember Assyria? Assyria was like a cedar of Lebanon. It was big. It was beautiful. It was strong. Verse 5, Therefore, its height was exalted above all the trees of the field, and its boughs were multiplied. And its branches became long because of the abundance of water. So it had all the supply it, as it sent them out. And the birds of the heavens made their nests under its boughs. Under its branches, all the beasts of the field brought forth their young. And in its shadow, all great nations made their home. As Assyria spread out, they took over tons of nations. And those nations became assimilated into the Assyrian nation. Seven, it says, thus it was beautiful in its greatness and the length of its branches, because its roots reached to abundant water, the cedars in the garden of God could not hide it. Talking about the garden of Eden. The fir trees were not like its boughs, and the chestnut trees were not like its branches. No tree in the garden of God was like it in beauty. I made it beautiful with a multitude of branches, so that all the trees of Eden envied it that were in the garden of God. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, because you have increased in height and set its top among the thick boughs, and its heart was lifted up in its height. Therefore, I will deliver it into the hand of the mighty one of the nations, and he shall surely deal with it. I've driven it out for its wickedness. And aliens, the most terrible of the nations, have cut it down and left it. Its branches have fallen on the mountains and in the valleys, and its boughs lie broken by all the rivers of the land. And all the people of the earth have gone from under its shadow and left it. Verse 13, on its ruin will remain all the birds of the heavens and the beasts of the field which come to its branches, so that no trees by the waters may ever again exalt themselves for their height, nor set their tops among the thick boughs, that no tree which drinks water may ever be as high enough to reach up to them. For they have all been delivered to death, to the depths of the earth, among the children of men who go down to the pit. And I'll be talking about that a little more in the next chapter. Thus says the Lord God, in the day when it went down to hell, I caused mourning. I covered the deep because of it. I restrained its rivers and the great waters were held back. I caused Lebanon to mourn for it and all the trees of the field wilted because of it. I made the nation shake at the sound of its fall when I cast it down to hell together with those who descended into the pit and all the trees of Eden, the choice and best of Lebanon, all the drink water were comforted in the depths of the earth. They also went down to hell, Sheol in the Hebrew, we'll kind of cover that in a little bit. Uh, of those who are slain by the sword and those who are in its strong arm, who dwelt in the shadow among the nations. To which of the trees in Eden will you then be likened in glory and greatness? Yet you shall be brought down to the trees of Eden to the depths of the earth. You shall lie in the midst of the uncircumcised with the slain by the sword. This is the Pharaoh and all his multitude, says the Lord God. So this whole thing basically was a picture of Assyria, a.k.a. Asher, and showing them they were so great and so powerful, but look how I tore them down. Look how I sent them to Sheol, to the pit, to hell. And they were the greatest of all trees. So Egypt, where are you going to be on the day I come for you? That's really a summarization of that whole chapter, but it's long and it's poetic. And so he's saying how he's going to disgrace Egypt. I mean, what do you think you're going to have to stand a chance? Now, I want to just tie this in quickly to a New Testament principle because we're moving quite along. We really only have one chapter to go and, and a couple of verses in chapter 33. I said tonight would move quickly because it really is very straightforward stuff as we try and make our way through this book. But he had likens Assyria to a tree. He likens Egypt to a tree. There are other places in the Old Testament where nations are likened to trees. In Luke 21, starting in verse 29, it says, Then he, Jesus, spoke to them a parable. Look at the fig tree and all the trees. And that's the thing I want to zero in on tonight. Many of us are familiar with the parable of the fig tree, a fig tree being symbolic of Israel. It says, When they are already budding, you see and know for yourselves that summer is now near. So you also, when you see these things happen, know that the kingdom of God is near. He goes on to say, Surely I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. Here's an interesting thing with this prophecy is that Jesus on Palm Sunday goes into the temple, right? He comes down, rides down on the donkey, he goes, he observes things, and he goes back up Mount of Olives to Bethany. He comes back the next day and drives out all the people, flipping over the tables for the second time now. He did it the first year he went into Jerusalem. And on that day, they walk by a fig tree, and he looks for fruit, but there's no fruit. So he curses it. And then the following day after that, 
they walk by and his disciples go, hey, master, that tree you cursed is dead. Like, and here's this fig tree, it is dead, dead now. And Jesus explained, you know, this is the idea that this is a parable of Israel who in the Old Testament is pictured as a fig tree. He didn't see the fruit at his first coming. And so it's kind of like this thing's stopping, but then he makes his promise later on, what we just read came later on, I think that day or the next day, as he teaches and he explains, but you guys know fig trees. Now, when you begin to see the fig tree start to blossom again, you know the time is soon. And many people have clung to that as we've seen Israel in 1948 become a nation again in 1967, get the, the Temple Mount back and Jerusalem back. 2017, America moves its embassy. I mean, you start seeing changes in the, in the recognition. But it's worth noting again that in Luke 21, he tells them, look at the fig tree, but also look at all the trees. Keep an eye on the world players. And as I mentioned, I'm trying to chug along through Ezekiel because I am excited to get back to Ezekiel 38, because in Ezekiel 38, we see all these nations mentioned, and they're mentioned by their ancient names. You got to go back into Genesis, to the beginning of Genesis, to the table of nations right after the flood, and you hear the names of 70 nations. And those ancient names, the Bible uses, we, we actually will see some tonight in this, later in chapter 32, we'll read about some of these names. Um, about Meshach and Tubal. And that's the idea is there's no modern nations with those names, but there's ancient nations. And if you know where they're located, you can see what the modern nation is. And what's fascinating is that when Russia was going down into Ukraine, we looked at Ezekiel because people were interested. What's going on? And now with what's going on in Israel, nothing about today's war is prophetic apart from just people hating Israel. That's prophetic. The Bible says that all nations are going to hate you. And you're going to be the most hated of all peoples. But as we watch different nations and where their stance is during this war, that's fascinating because nations that used to be more neutral or even on Israel's side are now anti-Israel. And there are some of those nations in Ezekiel 38 we read about. So this is coming up in a couple weeks, probably two weeks out. We'll be there and be looking at this. Um, but it's like there are random nations that are declaring their stances on Israel, and they're not even close to Israel. And you're like, why would they do that? What's funny is, but they are in Ezekiel 38. And so it's, it's interesting to watch as different nations and their political positions are being official, right? People are taking official stances. Are we for Israel or against Israel? And as you watch this playing out, we're starting to see more nations lining up with what we read in Ezekiel. And so this idea of watching not just the fig tree, Watch all the trees. Watch all the nations. Just kind of, if you watch world politics, line it up with your Bible, it's not hard to do. Well, I mean, you got to know your Bible and put the piece together. But once you see the pieces, you're like, okay, it makes sense. Here's these nations. Here's a map. Here's today. You start putting together, and it makes sense. So fascinating stuff. All right, chapter 32. Here's a lamentation for Egypt and for the other nations that have fallen. Now, even as I get going here, in fact, I'll read real quick. It came to pass in the twelfth year, in the twelfth month, on the first day of the month, that the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, take up a lamentation for Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and say to him, You are like a young lion among the nations, and you are like a monster in the seas, bursting forth in your rivers, troubling the waters with your feet, and fouling their rivers. Thus says the Lord God, I will therefore spread my net over you with a company of many people. They will draw you up in my net. Then I'll leave you on the land. I'll cast you out in the open fields, cause you to settle on, cause to settle on you all the birds of the heavens, and with you I'll fill the beasts of the whole earth. I will lay your flesh on the mountains and fill the valleys of your carcass. I will also water the land with the flow of your blood. Even to the mountains and the riverbeds will be full of you. When I put out your light, I will cover the heavens and make its stars dark. I will cover the sun with a cloud. The moon shall not give her light. All the bright lights of the heavens I will make dark over you and bring darkness upon your land, says the Lord God. Now, although I read down to verse 8, back in verse 1, I didn't give you a date. And the date is March of 585 B.C. And as we go through this, and again, it's kind of you're just reading along and it all kind of just moving, okay? But 
The last prophecy was June of 587. Two years have gone by in Ezekiel's life. And that just got me chewing on this thought. What happened between chapter 31 and chapter 32? Two years have gone by. We have no prophecies from Ezekiel. And it's just a good reminder when we read from guys like Ezekiel, it wasn't like he just sat down and penned the book of Ezekiel. This is the work of a lifetime. And it made me wonder, what if a year had gone by and Ezekiel just hadn't heard from God? A year of dryness. What do you do? Do you get discouraged? God stopped talking. A year and a half goes by. And I think just by a process of elimination and just logical thinking and a deduction, right? I don't think God would keep speaking with it through Ezekiel. If Ezekiel just kind of, well, it's been two years and God hasn't said anything, maybe he's done with me. I might retire from all this profiting. It's a lot of work. Versus, I think he stayed faithful. And what you watch with God and you watch it in your life, you've seen in other people's lives, God is not always moving in a way that you see it happening all the time. He's outside of time. Chapter 1, chapter 40, chapter 20, it's all the same day to God. He's outside of time. But in our lives, we have to sit here and grind through time. But I think you watch that if you stay faithful, God had a plan. The plan was to use you again in a powerful way, but it's two years out. But he's looking for people who will just keep going until that point comes. And then, boom, God speaks. You write a chapter of the Bible. You know, God does stuff. And then you wait again because God's waiting because he's at his timing. And so it's just something about the faithfulness of Ezekiel and just chewing on this idea, putting myself in his shoes, thinking about, you know, yeah, it's easy to read the book of Acts. People are casting out demons and speaking in tongues and raising the dead and all sorts of great stuff happening over a book that spans 30 years. And so as I think about the last 30 years of my life, I've had a lot of really awesome things happen. And I've got some amazing stories to tell over 30 years. And if I told them all to you in one night, it might just sound like, boom, boom. Man, look at all this cool stuff. But it's like, yeah, 30 years. 30 years of just, and I was not a Christian all those 30 years. <laughs> all right, that takes me back a little too young. But the point is that some of you have been Christians for 30 years. And some of us, if the Lord tarries, We've got 30 years to give to the Lord. And so it is. If we stay faithful, how many stories will we have? How many miracles can we speak of and all these things? But it's, it's staying faithful through all the valleys and all the dry seasons, realizing that I don't want to give up and get lazy right before God was going to do the greatest miracle in my life. You know, And so it's one of those things. You read the Bible and two years goes real fast. I was counseling a young woman her husband left her and she wanted, you know, to have hope. And I just reminded her, I said, I don't know if it's going to work out. I don't know if it is going to work out. But I'll tell you this much, that you've been to a women's retreat. You've been to things where someone gives her testimony. And she says, well, you know, we, our marriage was restored after a year and a half, after three years. And when you're listening to someone's testimony, that just goes in one ear and out the other. But when you're living out those three years... Those are 365 day years with 24 hours in each day wondering, what are you going to do, God? What is going to happen to my marriage? What is going to happen? What is going to happen? And so it's just that reminder. God keeps going. God is faithful. But us who are bound by time, it sometimes feels like an eternity, wondering when that next step is, that next big turn, that next big move of God. And I just think it's, it's going to eventually discourage people if we ever give them the idea that we're going to be seeing miracles every day, if we're going to be seeing certain things happening every day, because that's not what we see in the Bible. We see Paul's sweat rags healing people at one part of the book of Acts, and yet in Ephesians 2, he prays and wonders if Epaphroditus will live through this sickness he's experiencing, because obviously at that point in Paul's career, he wasn't doing miracle healing or whatever. I, I don't know, right? All I know is he's just like, man, I just thought he was going to die, is what Paul says in Philippians 2. 
Paul, don't you have any sweat rags left? Well, no, like it just, it wasn't that season. God was done with that season and he was on a different season in Paul's life. Paul writes to Timothy, take a little water with your wine for your stomach's sake. I ran out of sweat rags. Would have mailed you one for your contribution of $50 to sow a seed into my ministry. Okay, I'm done. No poking fun anymore. But that's just a big thing is we see two years go by and I know it's like a small, ironically with all this other stuff, I clung to that because it just spoke to me in a bunch of just, you know, the fall of Egypt text, that just kind of jumped out and was like, you know, it's good to remember. Here's Ezekiel still writing, you know, and people don't like Ezekiel. Well, you're going to read about that at the end of 33, right? Where they're, they, they listen to him, but they don't actually do what he says. All right, verse nine. I will also trouble the hearts of many peoples when I bring your destruction among the nations into countries which you have not known. Yes, I'll make many peoples astonished at you. Their king shall be horribly afraid of you when I brandish my sword before them. They shall tremble every moment, every man for his own life in the day of your fall. For thus says the Lord God, the sword of the king of Babylon shall come upon you. By the swords of the mighty warriors, all of them the most terrible of nations, I will cause your multitude to fall. They shall plunder the pomp of Egypt, and its multitude shall be destroyed. I'll destroy all its animals from beside its great waters. The foot of man shall muddy them no more. The idea being is there'll be no one walking in the Nile, so there'll be no muddiness because it's just flowing and there's no people there to stir it up. Nor shall the hooves of animals muddy it. I'll make the waters clear. I'll make the rivers run like oil, says the Lord God. When I make the land of Egypt desolate and the country destitute of all that once filled it, when I strike all who dwell in it, then they shall know that I am the Lord, this is the lamentation with which they shall lament her. The daughters of the nations shall lament her. They shall lament for her, for Egypt, and for all her multitude, says the Lord God. Now, this next section is interesting because it, it's two weeks later. So here's another two weeks go by. Not two years, but two weeks. And this is an interesting section of the Bible where this actually is one of the more clear parts of the whole Bible on the topic of eternal punishment. I.e., God is going to talk about all these people who have gone to Sheol, which we've read already has been translated as hell. That's the Hebrew word is Sheol. But all they are, they're all still down there. And there are churches and people who teach the idea of annihilationism. It's the teaching that once you die, you know, God just, you know, snuffs you out and you're done. But the Bible doesn't teach that. The Bible teaches that our souls, whether saved or unsaved, are eternal. And so we will live eternally with God or eternally apart from God. And here he's saying, you're going to go down there and there's, everyone's going to be there waiting for you is kind of the idea in this section. So verse, seven, or verse 18, Son of man, wail over the multitude of Egypt and cast them down to the depths of the earth, her and her daughters of famous nations, with those who go down to the pit. Whom do you surpass in beauty? Go down and be placed with the uncircumcised. Interesting fact that the Egyptians actually practiced circumcision just like the Jews did. And so it, for them, it was also a thing, the uncircumcised nations. It kind of spoke to them the same way it did to the Jew. Verse 20, they shall fall in the midst of those slain by the sword. She is delivered to the sword, drawing her and all her multitudes. The strong among the mighty shall speak to him out of the midst of hell with those who help him. They have gone down. They lie with the uncircumcised, slain by the sword. So he's saying, you're going to go down. There's going to be people who are going to talk to you. Verse 22, Assyria is there. So first mentions Assyria and all her company with all their graves all around her, all the slain fallen by the sword. Her graves are set in the recesses of the pit and her company is all around her grave. All of them slain fallen by the sword who caused terror in the land of living. There is Elam and all her multitude. Now, Elam is in the New King James Bible, at least, it's typically translated as Syria. And Elam, the, uh, the empire of Elam, was in the area of modern-day Syria, which is why our Bibles will say Syria, but that's who we're talking about here. Damascus is part of Elam. So a lot through the book of Kings and whatnot. There's a lot of battling where the Syrians come in, and they shouldn't ever be confused with the Assyrians. Totally different. So Elam and her multitude around her grave, all them slain, followed by the sword, who've gone down uncircumcised to the lower parts of the earth, who caused their terror in the land of the living, now they bear their shame with those who go down to the pit. Now they've set their bed in the midst of the slain with all her multitude, with all her graves around it. 
all of them uncircumcised, slain by the sword. Though their terror was caused in the land of the living, yet they bear their shame with those who go down to the pit. It was put in the midst of the slain. Here's now Meshach and Tubal for verses 26 to 28. Now Meshach and Tubal, when they separated after the Tower of Babel, they headed over to the area of Turkey. And so we know the ancient people. We don't know for certain who he's talking about per se, which people, but it's likely the Hittites because the Hittites were based out of Turkey and they would go down into Canaan and even all the way to Egypt in the ancient nations. And so before the Assyrian nation and the nation of Alam, the Hittites were one of the big players in the region. And it says, with all of their graves around it, all of them uncircumcised, slain by the sword, though they cause their terror in the land of the living, they do not lie with the mighty who are fallen of the uncircumcised, who have gone down to hell with their weapons of war. They've laid their swords under their heads, but their iniquities will be on their bones because of the terror of the mighty in the land of the living. Yes, you shall be broken in the midst of the uncircumcised and lie with those slain by the sword. It's worth noting, all of this is, here's all these pagan nations, and he's telling Egypt, you're going to go be with them. And it's twofold. Not only are you being put with the uncircumcised, which was a disgrace to the Egyptians, but also the fact that you're going to be slain among them. And the Egyptians, I think of all nations, were also known for their burial practices. We all know about mummies. Don't need to give a big talk on it. But they were very like religious, you might say, about dead people. They got wrapped a certain way. There was this whole big process of preserving dead bodies. So the idea of them just being killed and kind of just let out in the field was a huge disgrace to their culture. So this is what God is saying is going to happen though. 29, there is Edom, right? So the Edomites, her kings and her princes who despite their might are laid beside beside those slain by the sword. They shall lay with the uncircumcised, go down with those to the pit. There's the princes of the north, all of them in the Sidonians. So now you're going up by Tyre and Sidon, modern day Lebanon, who have gone down to the slain and shame of their terror, which they cause in their might. They lie with the uncircumcised, those slain by the sword. They bear their shame with those who go down to the pit. Verse 31, Pharaoh will see them and be comforted over all his multitude. Pharaoh and all his army slain by the sword, says the Lord. For I have caused my terror in the land of the living. He shall be placed in the midst of the uncircumcised with those slain by the sword. Pharaoh and all his multitude, says the Lord. That concludes the whole Egyptian prophecy section of Ezekiel. So it's a big, lengthy prophecy. It's the longest prophecy in the Bible about Egypt at all. And again, it it was a great nation. And it really was one of the greatest nations on the planet for thousands of years. So God gave them some page space in the Bible when he's telling them that they're going to go down to the pit. Now this morning, we covered verses 1 to 11. How God says, I want you to be a watchman, Ezekiel. Watch for the danger. See what's coming. And if you tell the people and they ignore you, that's their problem. But if you know danger is coming, Ezekiel, and you don't say anything, their blood's on your head. What's the message? Well, verse 10, the people say, well, we're all dying in our sins. That's a good place for people who are unbelievers to believe. Usually they think they're fine. But God says, tell him, verse 11, as I live, says the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn, turn from your evil ways, for why should you die, O house of Israel? Ezekiel in the whole Bible is actually one of the best places. Ezekiel 33, that verse, and a lot of Ezekiel 18. When people talk about, you know, does God send people to hell? No, he doesn't send people to hell. God respects your decision. God does everything he can to keep people from hell. The Bible tells us that God desires all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth, 1 Timothy 2, 4. It says that God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance, 2 Peter verse three, chapter 3, verse 9. And Ezekiel chapter 18 and Ezekiel chapter 33, God says, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked. In many ways, as counterintuitive it may sound at first, God just says, if it's up to me, you guys wouldn't die. But what is up to me is letting you have that choice. And I had someone even ask me just today, you know, (laughs) but isn't God sovereign and whatever he wants happens? Yes. And the first thing he wants is to give you that choice. 
That's the first thing he wants. Second to that is his desire you'll make the right choice. But his primary decision is, I want you guys to choose to follow me and choose to love me because if I don't give you that choice, your love is cheap, right? How many people in here have kids? Come on, there we go. Okay, how many people's kids have said I love you? Good. You remember when they first started saying it, though, how cute it was? I mean, like, oh, little Eliana, right? I mean, she's, she's two now. She's been saying it for a while. But so, I love you, you know, and like, and she says it at random. Isn't that great, though? Like, it's not the I love you and they copy, right? Copycatting is fine. I mean, it's cute. You're happy when they start speaking. But like, when it's just kind of like you're putting them down for bed, you know? All right, nighty night. Love you. And it's just like, aww. Now, what if I bought you a teddy bear with all those little like sound boxes inside of it? You know, when you squeeze it, it talks and it says, I love you. I mean, wouldn't that just touch your heart and move you? No, because it's like, it's cheap. It's a robot. It just does what it's programmed to do. That love gives me nothing. But when a living being who has every right to not love me if they don't want to says, I love you, that hits home. And I think that is why God says, first, I want to give them the opportunity to love me or not love me. But my desire is that all men should come to the knowledge of the truth. That's God's desire, that all men will be saved, come to the knowledge of the truth. He's like, well, yeah, that's my heart. Is anyone like, well, I hope that four out of five or two out of three of my kids love me. It's like, no, no, no. Like, we want all our kids to love us. But we also know that, I mean, it's also their choice, I guess. Hoping they all love me. But he says, man, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked at all. And it implies then that his pleasure is that the wicked turns from his way and lives. And once again, this verse speaks very much to the responsibility of man. Whose job is it? It's man's job to turn and live. God just puts it on the table. All I'm saying is turn and live. That's all you got to do. Turn to me and you get to live. And so people start to argue with God now in verse 12. Therefore you, O son of man, say to the children of your people, the righteousness of the righteous shall not deliver him in the day of his transgression. As for the wickedness of the wicked, he shall not fall because of it in the day that he turns from his wickedness, nor shall the righteous be able to live because of his righteousness in the day he sins. What it's saying is, and this is the Old Testament. We don't have Jesus yet. We don't have a lot of concepts that as Christians we understand but there's, there's stuff that relates and it does transfer over. In short, he's saying, well, I don't care about your ninth grade summer camp confession for Jesus, right? I, I want to become a Christian. That's great. Now you're 27 and you don't go to church. You live with your girlfriend and you have absolutely no interest in God. You do all these things. You live for, there's no signs. And that's what he's saying is in the day he's sinning, his past righteousness, like I can't look back there. I need to look at where you're at today. And it says, but the wicked, this is the, I, the promise of complete forgiveness. It says, in the day you decide to turn and live, all that past wickedness doesn't matter. It's gone, wiped clean. You just decide to turn and live. In the day that he turns from his wickedness, right? He shall not fall because of his wickedness in the day he decides to turn. And so it's saying the past doesn't matter. God is looking at what are, what's going on today. And I don't want to judge someone by the fruit they had years ago. I want to look at the fruit they have today. And at the end of the day, it's good for me and all of us to remember, I don't know people's hearts. God does. But I can look at their actions and I can make a wise decision on how I, as a Christian, should relate to them and minister to them. And if they are living like an unbeliever, I'm going to try and get them saved. You know, and that's the idea. I'm just going to look at the fruit today. So verse 13, when I say to the righteous that he shall surely live, but he trusts in his own righteousness and commits iniquity. None of his righteous works shall be remembered because of the iniquity that he has committed. He shall die. There's a key there. This is a guy who thinks, like, I've done enough good stuff that I'm going to be okay. And it's okay if I do some bad stuff because I do a lot of good stuff. That doesn't work with God. If it doesn't work with a judge, 
in a good but not perfect American court system, it doesn't work with a holy God. Your Honor, I know you guys caught me shoplifting, but I do donate to charity. Can you let me go? I mean, it doesn't work. I know I was going 70 down Euclid, but, <laughs> you know, I do donate to the food bank. Like, good works don't work with a judge when you try and art, because no, you're being judged for what you've done, and so you can't trust in your righteousness saying, well, I do all this good stuff. Doesn't work. Verse 14, again, when I say to the wicked, you shall surely die if he turns from his sin and does what is lawful and right. If the wicked restores the pledge, gives back what he has stolen, and walks in the statutes of life without committing iniquity, he shall surely live and not die. Let me take this. Actually, none of his sins, verse 16, none of his sins, not one, not a single of his sins which he has committed shall be remembered against him. He has done what is lawful and right. He shall surely live. This is what is lawful and right today. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. If you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you will probably go back and right some wrongs. If you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you'll probably get rid of some unhealthy things. If you believe, see, you don't do those things to earn God's favor, but when you believe in turn, because of the conviction of your heart, you, you start fixing things because you realize like, man, I was wrong of me. I need to do something about that. You don't do stuff to earn God's favor. You do stuff because you've already gotten God's favor because of grace. So verse 17, yet the children of your people say, the way of the Lord's not fair, but it is their way which is not fair. When the righteous turns from his righteousness and commits iniquity, he shall die because of it. But when the wicked turns from his wickedness and does what is lawful and right, he shall live because of it. Yet you say the way of the Lord is not fair. O house of Israel, I will judge every one of you according to his own ways. Guys, this is so today, it's hilarious. You mean you're telling me there's only one way to go to heaven? Yes, the free gift way. Like, that's what the message of the gospel is. God wants to give you heaven. Well, that's not fair. Wait, what? That's not fair. I mean, what if I want to get to heaven my way? You know, if, if you're dying in the hospital and someone's like, we found one medication that will save you, people are like, well, why can't I have two medications? I'm like, there's only one. But it's here. It's free. You can have it. You can live. Well, I don't think that's fair. What about all those other medications that aren't getting used right now? Isn't it unfair that they don't get to save me? I mean, people use this logic. And this is what God's saying. He's like, no, you're the ones who aren't fair. I'm very fair. My message is simply turn and live. That's it. Turn and live. Come to me and live. The only way to hell is over Jesus' dead body. He died for us. We have to literally forsake his sacrifice to go to hell. And putting it in sobering terms, because a bunch of people raise their hands with having kids, you have to think about it. Laying down your life is one thing. You choosing to lay down your kid's life is something else. And many of us would give our life for someone, but there's none of you I'd give one of my kids for. Not one because they're precious. And now imagine, I'll pick on Daniel, that I gave a son for you. And you say, no thanks. Man, that's what people do to God. God gave his son, and people say, man, we don't like your way. We want a different way. And so God says, man, you guys are the ones who are unfair. All I'm asking is just turn and live. Don't die. I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked. Now, there's only a few other verses that we, we did. We actually did 30 to 33. So 21, it's just short. It came to pass. He gives the date in the 12th year of captivity, in the 10th month, on the fifth day of the month, that one who escaped from Jerusalem came to me and said, the city has been captured. Now the hand of the Lord had been upon me the evening before the man had... Uh, who came, who had escaped, and he had opened my mouth. So when he came to me in the morning, my mouth was opened, and I was no longer mute. And so if you want your cross-reference back in chapter 24, verse 27, I mentioned it when we closed there the other night, 
um, chapter 24, verse 27, right? It says, hey, a man's going to escape. On that day, your mouth will be open to him who has escaped and you're not going to allow me. So it kind of saying, so basically he said, hey, Jerusalem's been destroyed. He prophesied that back in 24, but again, no internet, no phones. So he said, but there's a guy and he'll come. And it's a long way from Jerusalem to Babylon by foot. So, but when the guy finally got there, he's like, okay, here's the guy I said would come. And he's like, yeah, I got destroyed. When did he get destroyed? On this date. It's the date Ezekiel said. And to some extent, God was keeping Ezekiel mute. He wasn't talking to the people. He was doing all these interesting demonstrations, laying on his side, cooking weird stuff, doing, but now he's, his mouth is open. And so we'll see a little bit of a change in the book moving forward. Now, verse 23, then the word of the Lord came to me saying, son of man, they who inhabit those ruins in the land of Israel are saying, Abraham was only one and he inherited the land, but we are many. The land has been given to us as a possession. Therefore say to them, thus says the Lord God, you eat meat with blood. You lift up your eyes toward your idols and shed blood. Should you then possess the land? You rely on your sword. You commit abominations. You defile one another's wives. Should you possess the land? Say thus, uh, say thus to them, thus is the Lord God, as sure as I live, those who are in the ruins shall fall by the sword, and the one who is in the open field I'll give to the beast to be devoured, and those who are in the strongholds and the caves shall be die of pestilence, for I'm going to make the land the most desolate. Her arrogant strength shall cease, the mountains of Israel shall be so desolate that no one will pass through. Then they shall know that I am the Lord, when I have made the land most desolate because of all their abominations which they have committed. So in short, we read this, we were in Jeremiah not too long ago. And in Jeremiah, we see Jerusalem get destroyed. And unlike Kings and Chronicles, where it kind of just stops at the destruction of Jerusalem, Jeremiah goes on and says, people did get left behind. There was Gedaliah, there was this, there was that. Jeremiah gets abducted and taken to Egypt. But there were people who did stay. Not a lot, but some people stayed in the land. And basically, verse 24 is telling us, well, they said, well, God gave the land to Abraham, and he was just one man. Look, there's a bunch of us, the descendants of Abraham. So if there's a bunch of us, won't he give us the land? In short, they were banking on pedigree, on election, on their family history. They feel like we're shooed into this because we're the chosen ones. And God says, listen, God has no grandchildren. He only has kids. He is Abba Father. He's not Grandpa God. It doesn't matter who your parents are. You have to follow me yourself. doesn't matter that you're a descendant of Abraham. And he goes and lists off all these sinful things. He's like, listen, look at you. Look at all the way you live your life. I don't care what church your parents go to or if you were baptized as a baby or whatever it was. He's like, I don't care. He's like, we're looking at you today. And where you're at today, you cannot bank on, again, past experiences we talked about earlier. You cannot bank on your pedigree and your past and who your family is and who you know. You simply have to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. You know, that's a, heard it said, right? There's not going to be any Lutherans in heaven. There's not going to be any Methodists in heaven. There's not going to be any Pentecostals or Baptists in heaven. There's only going to be Christians in heaven. It doesn't matter the church you belong to. It doesn't matter the family you belong to. It just matters that you are a Christian, a son of God. You then get to go to heaven. Let's just read 30 to 33. I don't even need to comment on it because I do. I think it just speaks for itself. And it's, yeah, spoke to me. As for you, son of man, the children of your people are talking about you beside the walls and in the doors of the houses, and they speak to one another. Everyone's saying to his brother, please come and hear what the word of the, uh, is that comes from the Lord. So they come to you as people do. They sit before you as my people. They hear your words, but they do not do them. For with their mouth, they show much love, but their hearts pursue their own gain. Indeed, you are to them as a very lovely song of one who has a pleasant voice and can play well on an instrument. For they hear your words, but they do not do them. And when this comes to pass, surely it will come that they will know that a prophet has been among them. And so really, this is a, a ver verse for any prophet, any pastor, any Bible teacher, just to take to heart, you know, and for people that my job isn't to sound good. My job's not to be entertaining. You guys want a little secret? If I was here to be entertaining, we would not be in Ezekiel right now. 
I'm just saying, like, if this was about like, I'm going to pick the best, the most jam-packed, exciting, we would not be in the prophecies against Egypt and Ezekiel. But instead, I have a different commitment. My commitment is to teach the entire Bible. We have started in Genesis. We have over three quarters of the Bible taught as a church, every single chapter, every single verse. And I'm not repeating a book till we're done. That's my goal. So I'm going through the rough stuff and we jump to the New Testament. We get some stuff that's a little bit easier to flow through, maybe a little more applicable, but we're not repeating a chapter or a book until we're done because my job isn't to to a lovely song and to have a nice voice or this. No, it's to teach the Bible and give people God's word so that they can take what God has to say and apply it to their lives. But it's up to them. And that's a really, it's a comfort for me to remember. I don't know how many pastors told me this last week. I had a lot of good conversations and just guys I don't get to see in the flesh very often, friends chatting with pastors, hanging out with with guys I know. And it's just funny to hear During the sermons, just keep teaching the word, Pastor. Go over and talking with Tony Clark. How's it? He's like, man, you just keep teaching the word. Go over here. You talk. Just keep teaching the word. And that's the exhortation I got. I don't know how many times last week. Yep, it's not my job to make people believe. You just teach the word, and it's up to them to choose if they're going to do or not do what God says. And so. I'm just here to try and make it easier to understand so it's easier to apply. The rest is up to you. Let's pray. Let's worship our Lord.